on a Gothic tower built by Stalin. Moscow's crack dirt assault squad swings into action. Andrei Asupkov, a champion Soviet climber turned cleaner, has worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week, to sand back decades of stagnation. The city government ordered these mountaineers to clean the facade of the landmark Ukraine hotel in time for Moscow's birthday. Andrei normally survives on 300 US dollars a month. For the past three months, he's made ten times that. Across Moscow, public buildings have been repainted, restored and rebuilt for the city's anniversary. The Russians have one word for it, remont. And this has been the biggest peacetime remont in Moscow's 850 year history. It's turning the city into the one place where Russians feel confident of getting ahead. Definitely it's not the best place, uh, it is a very exciting place. It's a place which really give you feel what if you want to achieve something, you want to move something big, yes it's all key, it's only up to you go and do it. Sunday morning is the only time Michael Krell has to enjoy his adopted city. The rest of the week he's too busy making money. Michael is part of Russia's new business class. Twenty years ago he left Moscow as a Jewish emigre to start a new life in Australia. But since communism's demise he's spent more time here than in Sydney, organising joint ventures for foreign companies in a city he now sees as the world's greatest boom town. It's the biggest market in the world. It's the biggest uh, storage of mineral resources. Uh, it's uh, perhaps one of the most cultural and educated workforce, if I can say it, but it's a workforce. Uh, it's only a matter of putting all components together. In Moscow, this involves accepting that things are done a little differently. The city bristles with more guns than at any time since the Russian Revolution and no one does business here without protection. But what distinguishes Moscow from the rest of Russia is that there are countless opportunities, even in the need for guns. One of Michael Krell's best business tips was advising his old friend Valery Balichka to start his own security firm. Valery's team had Russia's best training and an unbeatable marketing pitch. They're all ex-agents of the KGB. Valery once headed security for Mikhail Gorbachev. And as Michael himself found when he recommended them to some clients, the ex-KGB look after their customers. I'm representing a few major companies in, in Russia. We never have any problem of any, any nature. Neither cars were stolen, neither uh, anyone break in the office, neither one was attacked personally, neither one was approached for some kind of ransom. We dealing with the hard commodities, oil, diamonds. All what we have, a sticker on the car and the uh, logo of the KGB Veterans Association on our office stating what this office or this business uh, protected by uh, such association. Uh, that's good enough to us. So KGB is still the best name to scare people? Scaring the people who have to be scared. <laughs> 
сделал сигнал тревоги шестого объекта. Срочно на выезд. On the principle that any publicity is good for business, Colonel Belichka insisted we see how these former secret agents respond to an emergency call. Normal duties aren't quite so dramatic. They're usually manning foyers, checking documents. Colonel Belichka and many of his men lost their jobs over their involvement in the 1991 coup. But, like many of the old communist elite, they were best positioned to cash in on the new capitalism. And they're making it big in Moscow. Прибывает КГБ, то это может быть даже и любопытно. Но дело в том, что на самом деле Комитет Госбезопасности это была организация, которая была наиболее информирована. Но до того, как я оказался на пенсии, я посетил не один десяток стран. Я видел, как живут в Америке, я видел, как живут в Новой Зеландии, я видел, как живут в Южной Корее, видел, как в Африке, в Латинской Америке. Поэтому для нас, в принципе, для коммунистов с большой буквы, все-таки понятие коммунист – это не ортодоксальная упертость в какую-то одну идею. Это возможность все-таки гибко оценивать политическую, геополитическую ситуацию. Another ex-communist with a flexible way of doing things is the city mayor, Yuri Lushkov. Today he's inspecting his proudest work, a new 180-kilometer ring road around Moscow. Almost every road beyond this is a pothole death trap. But for the people inside the ring, Lushkov is the man turning Moscow into a near-normal city. The mayor heads out every Saturday to inspect the city works, berating the workers for any delays and somehow finding money for their wages and supplies. His can-do style has made him astonishingly popular, winning 90% of last year's mayoral vote. Many believe he's positioning himself to become Russia's next president. If there's one thing that makes Lushkov testy, it's any suggestion the city government is corrupt or wasteful. На город, на наши мощные строительные организации, на наши экономические системы осуществляется такое необоснованное давление, нападение и претензии, которые выдвигаются без анализа, без серьезной проработки, без сравнения и даже без элементарных вычислений. И Бог с ними. Они нам не нужны на нашем празднике. But some cynics can't help wondering where all the money is coming from. Вы сегодня мэрия, заслуга правительства Москвы. Но ведь это внешняя сторона. Москва это не Россия. Россия шире, чем Москва. Но Москва сегодня аккумулировала весь капитал, аккумулировала все финансы, аккумулировала все умы, говорится, наиболее энергичные России. Она ставит в очень сложное положение всех остальных. Ни один вопрос ни в Воронеже, ни в Кирове, ни в Тамбове не решается без Москвы. То есть надо ехать, надо пробивать, надо давать взятки чиновникам московским. А чиновники московские на эти взятки строят дома и все остальное. No one's been building houses for Moscow's homeless. The city's main contribution to reducing their numbers was rounding up several people and expelling them before the birthday. For perhaps a third of the city that lives in dire poverty, Moscow is a desperate place. Many live solely on the meagre handouts of foreign charities. But however bad the poverty is in Moscow, the city is still a magnet for people from the provinces. For 19-year-old Natalia, this is the city of dreams. 
She's left her home in dirt poor Siberia to try to make it as a model in the big city. Competition will be tough, but her head start was winning second prize in a national modelling contest organised by a Moscow magazine. The organiser, Olga Hramalova, is the sort of role model who barely existed ten years before. She left her small town to escape the stifling lack of opportunity. Now she runs the magazine's advertising. Olga's become a member of a group that's almost non-existent elsewhere in Russia, a middle class. Olga and her husband Alexei have few trappings of Western wealth. They still live in an old Soviet street. But they are slowly moving ahead. They're paying off a foreign car, the only one in the street. And they're earning enough money to help out their parents and save for somewhere better. For now, they live in a tiny three-room apartment and they're reinventing themselves to survive. Olga once worked in a military plant, while Alexei was a painter. Jobs that depended on state subsidies. Alexei has now put away his brushes to become art director for a budding designer studio. In communism, it was much more simple. I graduated the institute and I knew what I should do, the salary I would gain, and I know all my steps till I retired. It was boring. Whatever difficulties they have, they would never go back to the way things were. Ну, скажем так, я все время стремилась к независимости с чьей-либо стороны, там, родителей, там, мужа, ну, в общем, родственников, то есть все. Вот. А сейчас я уехала из своего родного города. Я живу в Москве, я вышла замуж, у меня хороший муж, которого я очень сильно люблю. Вот. Ну, извини, но так вот случилось. Tonight, Natalia will be announced as one of the winners of Olga's modelling competition. She doesn't dare even utter what she hopes will come of it. The venue is just one of 300 nightclubs that have sprung up in Moscow since the end of communism. The clientele are the envied minority who've grown rich under the new rules. There are times when it's hard to believe that this is the same city that once ruled communism. The girls' parents could never have hoped for the things their children now aspire to. Though it's not hard to imagine the pitfalls they could face in the centre of bandit capitalism. <laughs> Moscow's birthday passed in a weekend. But the preparations have left a city transformed. At least by the Soviet standards from which it's rising. The climb to the top in Moscow is far harder than it should be, and nobody catches you if you fall. But at least there are heights to aim for.
and after 850 years of being downtrodden, that is something to celebrate.